grace, mercy, peace to you from God, our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the one who gives us life and shows us the way forward. Amen. So way back in the spring, at the end of the spring, into the summer, we ended our Whistle Stop tour, or at least took a break from our Whistle Stop tour through the Bible uh, on the, the book of, of Jonah. A good place to stop, but we're pulling into the next station, Micah, one of the other minor prophets, the next on the list. And I pray that you have your ears, your ears roaming around listening for good news, because we're going to do some detective work tonight. It's there all in the text, if we have the eyes to see it, and I pray that your eyes and ears are open and listening to hear and see what God has for you. And as I like to remind us, the, the reason why we're here, I think it can be lost on us sometimes, myself included, but here are the couple questions I like to ask. Why do we read the Bible? And what does his voice do? His voice can change our lives. He's looking for transformation in our hearts and lives. And so as we lean into the book of Micah, allow me to pray for us as we, we seek out his word in his way. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So as we get started here, let me toss a couple of names out here and see if you can ferret out the connection between these different people. So Sherlock Holmes, Nancy Drew, Hercule Poirot, Miss Marple, Father Brown. I'm sure some of you could probably add to this list. Yes, they are all detectives. Some of the best known in the world from their exploits and what are these people all very good at doing? What's that? Finding the murderer. Okay, that's one way of putting it. I was going a little bit more abstract, but that's true. They know how to see things for what they are. They know how to suss out the evidence. They have their eyes open, and they can see the detail, often the one little detail that will make the difference between a case being lost in obscurity and it being cracked. So... Do we see evidence, little bits of things here and there scattered throughout our world that if we have the eyes to see and the attention span to kind of lean into them, there will be a wealth of, of insight there. I think this is done by all sorts of people in many different ways. Whether we're talking about the, some very old examples like Hansel and Gretel who left the, a little bread um, crumb trail so they could get back home. Or we're talking about something as more modern as Taylor Swift, who likes to hide all of her next greatest, greatest and best things in her lyrics in some sort of obscure way. But the fans, the super fans, always know where she's going. I've all, even heard that there is this grand unif unified theory of Pixar films, that they all somehow exist in the same universe. And there are some people who have gone to great lengths to detective work their way into making it all fit together. That's a whole different conversation. But... Wherever we go, all the best stories have interconnected pieces, and they have little bit of bits of evidence that sometimes just the right bit of evidence at just the right time is what it takes to move the story forward. Everything from Lord of the Rings to Harry Potter to Narnia has some beautiful illusions, especially the presence of Aslan. And to those of, of us who see Aslan as the Jesus character in those stories, it's wonderful when Aslan shows up, all roars sometimes, and sometimes in soft little whispers around the people he cares about. We are called to be detectives of God's word, to be ones who observe the world around us and not only see God's word and his intent in the world around us, but also in our own lives. And I think we certainly see that in, in Scripture. Now, one of the things I like to point out, one thing that may have flown past you is the way that I greeted you this evening. Did you see that? That came very easy. I said, hey, and y'all said, hey. Well, if you rewind a, a little while and back to the very first sermon in this whole series, it's so long ago, it's, it's almost exactly a year, we had this conversation about God giving a part of his name to Abram and Sarai. He makes Abram into Abraham, that hey in Hebrew, as you can see written in red there, and Sarai becomes Sarah, also the, the hey. Now, scholars will point out very quickly that many, there's many ways of interpreting this, but 
we notice that the, the, word, the name Yahweh has two of these He's in it, and so God imparts part of his name, which is very closely connected to his identity, to these two special people who become the ancestors of his people. We, uh, scholars will also note that the, the word or the letter He in Hebrew has a couple of key concepts connected to it. That He can be connected to um, identity, it can be connected to breath, that God breathes his identity onto these two people and they become his. Uh, it can also be connected to this idea of communication, that the, the gift of, of He and breath means that you can communicate with someone. So when God gives his He to Abram and Sarai, he gives them not only the opportunity to communicate with him and live in relationship with him, because that's key, but he also gives them the opportunity, even the responsibility, to proclaim and communicate his presence to the rest of creation. Kind of cool stuff here. So when I say hey to all of you, it's more than just a kind of a trite American greeting. It's to say, you bear the image of God. Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus gave him, himself so that you could have resurrected life. He imparts his identity on you. And that's a good thing to be reminded of. I kind of wanted to point that out as we, we started. Because Micah is kind of a, an obscure book, I suppose. Uh, you can see here some of the overarching information, kind of where he lived and when he lived. Kind of the key characteristic, I suppose, is that the, you can break the book up into three sermons, starting with chapters 1 and 3 and 6, and the first word of the sermon is listen or hear, shema, listen up, people. So, uh, and well, another thing that should be noted, I suppose, is that Micah is a contemporary of Isaiah. Now, if you look at the two books, Isaiah and Micah, on the bookshelf of the Bible, you'll see that Isaiah is this big, long book. It's, it's a very long prophecy that was recorded and preserved. 66 chapters. On the other hand, Micah is just seven chapters, so a, a much smaller bit of work that was recorded and set down. But these two prophets who come from the same places and, and in some ways express God's indignation about the same kinds of things that he sees. Quite often, the, the rich living, um, living it up and the, and the poor not being cared for. This is very close to the heart of God. Both prophets express this. But both of these prophets also drop key breadcrumbs in the story of God in some magnificent ways. And so as we dig into the scripture passage a little bit, we'll start with Isaiah, because this is the beautiful breadcrumb that Isaiah drops in verse 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Here's the breadcrumb, essentially. When you hear sign, think breadcrumb. The virgin will conceive, something that shouldn't biologically be able to happen. The virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. Now, what are the chances of that happening? One in million, trillion, gazillion, whatever you want to put on it. This is a very specific thing. And yet, it happens when Jesus comes on the scene. Same thing with Micah. If we fast forward to Micah 5, I want to point this out, and we'll see how it comes to bear fru fruit in, in Matthew in just a moment, but this is Micah 5. You have to understand that the, the southern kings of Judah had gone in, into relationship in a, a, a military standpoint. Um, Judah had... Judah's kings had found out that they couldn't stand on their own, so they called in the Assyrians to kind of help them out militarily, and they got more than they bargained for. In fact, they were deposed, and the throne and the kingdom of God's people was taken away from them, and it wasn't to be restored until much later. But let's listen to this. Now, daughter who is under attack, Judah, you slash yourself in grief. A siege is set upon us. They are striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. So in other words, the king of Israel, the one who bears that royal bearing, is being denigrated and embarrassed because of what the, the, the um, Assyrians have taken from him. And everybody is embarrassed. But here's the promise. Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and that's important, because someone pointed out to me once, there are two Bethlehems in Israel. One of them is closer to Nazareth. This is to distinguish. It's not that Bethlehem. It's the one that David will come, or David came from. Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. Just a tiny little hamlet. And even though so many important things happened, in it, it kind of remained that way. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. So a future king is going to come. But where does he come from? 
from antiquity. How can he both be the one who is to come and the one who has always been? It can only be the Messiah, the one who has always been, who will come and set things right. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. God's people are going to have rough times, and they're not going to hold their own sovereignty until, this is a, an allusion to Mary, then the rest of the ruler's brothers will return to the people of Israel. And you notice how Jesus called his disciples brothers. He didn't say, you're my subjects. He says, you're my friends. You're my family. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord, his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will be will extend to the ends of the earth. So not only will they find the thing that they've longed for, the security of there not being war made on them anymore, which is what we all long for, not being under siege. But his greatness is not just going to be located in this one spot. It's going to be throughout the entire world. And then come these last five beautiful words, and that's where we'll stop. He will be their peace. He will be their peace. What do we all long for? True peace, not just the absence of war, but inner heartfelt peace. Things are settled. Things are done. There's no more battles to fight. There's no more sickness to fight. There's no more quarrels to come up. It is just peace, right relationship. That's what we long for, and Jesus is going to bring that. So it may seem insignificant that this little verse 2 that talks about Bethlehem Ephrathah <laughs> is going to be a breadcrumb that leads and guides the story of Jesus for us. We fast forward to Matthew 2, and we hear the story of the Magi. Now, one thing I'll point out to you in a few weeks when we get to the, the Gospel of Matthew is that Matthew is oriented very much toward Jewish hearers. So there are many allusions to the Old Testament, the most allusions to the Old Testament in any of the four Gospels. So why do we have these foreign magi that figure so prominently in the nativity story? Why? Partially because this good news is for all people, like we heard Micah just talk about. So here's where we find the Magi showing up. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem Ephrathah of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. And they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him because he was not the one to allow anybody to be king except for him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes, all those textual detectives of God's people, and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. You know which prophet they're talking about, right? They're talking about Micah. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Do you see the through line? Do you see the breadcrumb that's been dropped way back? And now here it lands in the, the lap of the Magi, who know where to find the newborn king, who know where to find the one who will save the world, know where to find the one who gave his life for them, the one who will rise one day to proclaim the victory that we all long for. That's what's coming. And these magi need this one little sign, this one little pointer to say, this is where you're going to find him. My friends, I think we all need reminders like that. Little pointers, little signs, little breadcrumbs to remind us that we are not alone in this fight, that we don't walk alone. Because sometimes life can be pretty isolating. Things can be difficult. And we don't either want to or are not able to pay attention to what's happening right in front of us. Sometimes we lose the plot. Sometimes what's going on distracts us from all the ways that God has been present with us every day of our lives, how he has seamlessly sown his story into ours. And so on those days, it's good to have these little breadcrumbs to take us back in the direction of home. What's the main point? God places his name on you at baptism. He gives you hay. He gives you his life. He gives you his identity. So when you look at the font, when you interact with water at any point in your day, 
you can be reminded i'm a child of god jesus gave his life for me i am immensely valuable to god when you take the lord's supper i think is another great example of how god places himself in front of us and so his story is written into your story to remind you of his presence and his providence especially when things are difficult you don't walk alone if you have have the eyes to see it you can see that he's been there all along so as we're kind of leaning into this practice of prayer in the coming days i'm generally going to be finishing uh, my messages by kind of leaning into what my prayer is for you and to ask you to consider how you can grow in your prayer life so my prayer for you this coming week is that you would be a detective of god's presence the likes of of sherlock holmes or hercule perot have your eyes open look at the details take the time to sit with god and ask him what do you have to show me what am i not noticing that's going to give me hope and encouragement because we all need that especially in the, the the direst moments your story is overcome and over undergirded and encouraged and brought forward and pushed forward by the one who has placed himself in the stars and in the, the tiniest recesses of your heart. That's the kind of God we serve. And that's the kind of God who wants us to pay attention to what he's doing because he always pays attention to us. Now, that, does that sound like good news to you? Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for faithful people like Micah who dropped breadcrumbs in front of people around him. Breadcrumbs that didn't really mean a whole lot at that moment but came to have immense value for people who sought you, like the Magi. We pray that we likewise would follow you wherever you take us, whether it be by breadcrumb, whether it be by star, but most importantly, by your precious word, by your sacraments that remind us who we are. Thank you for giving us a part of your identity, calling us your own, making us a part of your family. And let us, to live, let us live that out. Let us, let us live in relationship with you. And come to you in prayer every day, asking you what you would have of us and what you want to show us. Give us eyes to see and hearts to believe and follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts and minds always in Christ Jesus, the one who leads you forward.